We're back on Brew of a Blue here on the Blue Room YouTube channel and podcast as well. Hope everybody's doing okay. I'd like to say, joining me now, another great guest. It's Rob Sawyer, football historian, football writer, uh, Everton Heritage member, uh, and all around lovely fella, lovely Evertonian. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Rob, thanks very much for coming on. Are you well? I'm good, thanks, Matt. Good to see you. Yeah, it's been a it's been a tough time. We just finally got to grips with Zoom again uh, at the start of the start of the record, and I'm still getting used to all this. I've been done loads of these calls now. I still can't quite get it right, but but there we are. But <laughs> how, how are you finding lockdown? How are you finding life under under the pandemic? Yeah, okay. When when it was just sort of on the cusp of the lockdown, I think like everybody, you know, was really quite tense about you know what was going to happen. But once it sort of started, you just kind of accept it and get on with it. Uh, and my friend Jamie Yates, he, he made the comment, us, us soccer nerds who sit at home and do research, it's like our time has come. We can just lock ourselves away and uh, do the stuff we enjoy. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it's been good. And um, plenty of time with the family. The dog, the dog's never had it so good. She's had people around <laughs> all the time. She, she'll hate it when we all go back to work. So, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm good. Thank you. Is, is that how you've sort of approached it then? You, you've thrown yourself into to that, that sort of, you know, passion yeah, well, for research and stuff? It's been a good opportunity being off, off work for a few weeks. Uh, of course, I have been roped into doing some painting and DIY as well. So uh, not just football, but uh, yeah, I'm just getting time with the family. And now it's relaxing a little bit. It's good to get exercise, getting out there with, the, with them. So yeah, I must say it's not as bad as I feared when, when we were on the cusp of the lockdown, when I'm sure like everybody, it was a, that sort of feeling of dread. But we seem to be coming through it and uh, fingers crossed things continue to improve. Yeah, I think the, the 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 struggle which I've sort of had with it, but the biggest thing, especially over the last few weeks, is getting that that sort of motivation. And I think, like you said there at the start of the lockdown, when I thought I was going to be locked away, you know, be able to focus on you know various different things, different passions, different hobbies you might want to get into, and you know, it's dead motivated. But I think when you you're inside a lot of the time and you're not you're not going out, you're not seeing people, you've not got that social aspects to your life, and you just sort of contained to it. I found it quite hard to, to keep that up. I mean, I, I don't know if you felt the same or not, but. I think I think it's it's one of those one of those things that a lot of people have spoken about as being a bit of an issue. Yeah, no, I take your point, but on the other hand, I've I've had stuff to get on with that I've enjoyed, and that helps. Apart from the yeah. painting, um, <laughs> <laughs> so it's stuff I've been putting off or haven't had the time to do because of because of work. So I have tried to grasp the opportunity and be fairly disciplined. And I guess you've had obviously this kind of stuff to do, which is must be yeah. really enjoyable. You've had some great guests on to date. Yeah, it's been it's been wonderful so far. Like I said, it's one of the reasons I thought, I thought I'd do it, try and keep something going every day, keep a reference point. But it seems like a lot of people we've had up in painting different things. What what have you been painting? Oh, fences, the outside of the house, the kitchen. You know, I've got my Everywhere. own little, uh, I've got my own army of people giving me tasks, giving me a list to do, and uh, yeah. don't really have an excuse not to do them. So uh, yeah, yeah, I've done a done a few bits. The house is looking better. I'm not sure many houses are. Nothing red, I imagine. What do you think? <laughs> but uh, but uh, no, no, not much blue either, I'm afraid. A lot of grey and white. So uh, yeah. th those are the colours that people like, apparently. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> yeah, let's have, have a chat about some, some Everton stuff there now. You know, one of the, the main stories which broke yesterday was, was about Leighton Baines. Looks like he's going to sign. Well, he's been offered a, a new one-year contract. Um, I think it just seems like a, a really sensible decision to, to me, Roberts. You know, he's, he's shown he can cut it still this season. Good lads have around the place. Um, just feels like a, a no-brainer for the football club, really. Yeah, it's great to have that consistency. I mean, he's been there for well over 10 years now. He's clearly a great guy, and he must be such a great mentor to the um, to the other lads coming through, just the way, he, just his professionalism, the way he trains. And like you say, even though he'd barely played for a year, he comes in when uh, Luca Dean's out and just slots in like he's never been away. So I, I do hope he stays on. But I also hope that we're looking at another left back, you know, for a year hence, because we can't, sadly, we can't have Leighton <laughs> forever. And I hope we do have a sort of a plan. I'm sure Marcel Brands has a plan looking, looking ahead as to um, who that might be. Because, of course, we had Anthony Robinson, who seems, seems a really good yeah. left back with lots of potential. I mean, it's very sad that that transfer to Italy fell through for him. But um, I think that's the trouble. You have these good youngsters coming through, but they hit that blocker, don't they, and uh, have to move away. So I hope there is some succession planning for the day when Leighton does finally hang up his boots. But I hope he stays in football in some way, hopefully with us. But maybe he'll be off to America strumming his guitar. Who knows? But yes. he's, he's a wonderful player. 
yeah, it seems like he's going to go that way, doesn't he? After he finishes, but it just it'd just be interesting to get your thoughts on on his career overall at Everton and where he stands. Because, like I said, you know, in the introduction, you are very much into your history of Everton Football Club. You've done a lot of writing about the history of football, the football club, and I think when we see these all time elevens and you know various you know teams that people have put together from from their time watching the match, I think. Leighton Baines seems to be the, the one player from this generation and this era, certainly the Premier League era, that, that gets into to those all-time 11s more often than not. I mean, w- would you put him up there in terms of, of Everton players or are you very much of the mindset that you've got to win something to be in, in that bracket? No, you, you can't say you got to win something because you could be a, a fantastic player in, in an average team and never win anything. Um, yeah, I'll put him up there. In my, in, in my time watching the Blues, I think he's the best, most complete left back. Uh, the way he, the way he goes forward as well as defending. I'm sure if I was ten years older, twenty years older, I'd be saying it's Ray Wilson. And if I was sixty years older, I might be saying Wardy Creswell or, or somebody. So, I think we always have to be cautious. But certainly in my lifetime, he's one of the few real. Well, in my past thirty years, he's one of the real top level players that we've had. Uh, and we should treasure him where we've got him. Um, you often don't realise till they've left what you're missing. Uh, we're lucky that Luca Dean has come in and um, hit the ground running. I, I, I think he's not had quite the same season this this time round, but that, that's natural. Uh, although the stats seem to suggest he is still hitting the heights. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't yeah. know what. So you know, I don't know what your thoughts are. Uh, but we seem to be lucky that uh, we've sort of seen almost seamlessly gone from Leighton being the, the first choice to. To Luca coming in and, and and being magnificent, yeah, and I think it's it's sort of testament to Leighton's quality, isn't it? That he's still, you know, he's been dropped in, he's been parachuted into games this season, and been able to just just settle straight back into it, hasn't he? I mean, I, I put something on Twitter last night. I think we all know his his class on the ball and his ability to deliver and score spectacular goals he's done down the years. But I think for me, the one thing that's sort of gone under the radar a little bit with Baines in his, his time at Everton, certainly in the years when he was at his peak, was he just played games week after week. Um, you know, he put together that ridiculous run, didn't he? Start on a lot of games. He's obviously had a few injuries later in his career, but I think his conditioning and his fitness has always been a huge aspect of his game. That's probably gone a bit underrated. Yeah, no, he's got a great engine, and, and as you say, he's looked after himself. Clearly, I think he's, people say he's a, a wonderful trainer, professional, looked after his body, and 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 that, and that shows that he's still playing well into his mid thirties. Um, yeah, I'm considering myself lucky to see him. And those few years when he was with uh, Pinar when they were both at their peak, you know, it was a joy to behold. Uh, that sort of late 2000s, sort of 2008, that 2009 yeah. with um, that, that team under Moyes. So you, you look back now and realise just how good it was. Maybe you, you don't appreciate things at the time, but, you know, we'd, I think most of us would kill to have a, a team of that sort of quality and unity now. Um, and let's hope Mr Ancelotti can uh, mould that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the, the interplay between them two, as you said there, you know, Moyes obviously gets talked down quite a lot as being a, someone who played dour football and was, was very pragmatic and negative in that sense. But, you know, everyone still harks back to that time when, when those two used to, used to turn up on, on the left-hand side and the interplay between the, the two of them was yeah. fantastic. So so with that in mind, yeah, it's, it's going to be sad when he, when he does go eventually late in, but, but fingers crossed it's, it's going to be for another season yet, at least. Um, absolutely. Let's, yeah, just come on to, to have a chat about yourself, Rob, and, you know, the, the things you've been doing, people who might not be aware of your work. And, I was sort of reading back through, you know, your back catalogue of books today and read some of your pieces you've been doing with Toppy Web recently, which have been really fascinating as well. I just wanted to, to ask you, it, it seems to me as though you've always sort of focused on the underdog and the unheralded a little bit in, in, in your writing <laughs> career. Would that, would that be fair yeah. to say? Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. I think it's, uh, I just like delving in and trying to bring stories to people's attention that have maybe gone under the radar. So yeah, whether that's players, managers, or just interesting little stories, really. Um, I mean, it'd be you know it'd be great to write about Dixie Dean all the time, or you know, but plenty of people have done that. So I've tried to just look for the different angles and different people, and hopefully provide interesting content and reading for people. Is that is that it? Was that a conscious decision, sort of, when you you got into to write and decide you were going to be a writer that you wanted to explore these different avenues, or have you always just sort of had a passion for those those unheralded people, those sort of you know, the, the players and the managers and the figures that have been uninvestigated? Yeah, I've always been a bit of a nerd. So, to, you know, <laughs> always, had the, always had these sort of Everton who's who's books and history books and always been fascinated flicking through and learning about the people or coming across people who maybe there isn't that much information about and there was that curiosity to 
to do the research and find out more about them. And I suppose that's how the Harry Catrick book came about. My first book was um, mm. just wondering what, you know, Harry left, Harry sort of got the boot, if you will, in 73. And then it didn't really say what happened to him. So just that curiosity to find out what happened in the rest of his life and, uh, and, and things went from there. Uh, and with the Harry Catrick book, I was just very lucky to have a conversation with James Corbett, the, the guy behind the Kubertown books. And he, he took a punt on me and, and very kindly, you know, backed me to, to turn it into a book. So uh, I'm always very grateful to James. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a fascinating time, that, that, that spell in Everton's history, because I think, you know, yourself and, and Gav Buckland more recently have done an excellent job of, of examining, examining that, that period. And, you know, sort of going back to, to the initial question about the underdogs and the sort of the people that, you know, aren't really spoken about much, I think Harry Catterick is, is one of them people. And, you know, it's, it's weird to say about someone who's one of the biggest figures in Everton's history and one of the most successful figures in Everton's history. But I think just by virtue of the, you know, the year he, he managed in, and certainly, potentially, by how he conducted himself with the media and with a lot of his players, it feels as though there's not been that much to say about him. So I imagine for yourself as an author, it must have been quite difficult going back and sort of trying to paint a picture of this man who didn't really want to put a picture of himself across very much. Yeah, I mean, I, I spoke to lots of his ex-players and you, you'd sort of ask them, you know, tell me about Harry and they'd say, well, we didn't see that much of him or, you know, he, he could give you a, a real dressing down one day and be nice the next you know there wasn't whereas if you asked Ian St John or somebody about um, Bill Shantley and many of us they could be telling anecdotes for you know for hours on end but that just wasn't Harry so it was trying to get get beneath that and understand the man a little bit more I suppose that the book and not just as a manager but understand his life as a player which doesn't get talked about as much you know he'd been at Everton pretty much all his life and uh, it was just fascinating to learn about that side of him but yeah it, it was a challenge you couldn't just uh, have a book full of laugh along <laughs> anecdotes and uh, you know and Harry wasn't one for these wonderful quips like Shantley came along with so I had to, I had to approach him with a different angle and just try and understand the man and his achievements and uh, and he mentioned Gavin's book um, yeah. Everton and Dixes and that and that just takes it to a whole new level not just about Harry but about John Moores and, and the way that Everton were those that that giant for that that fascinating decade. So, if people listening to this, watching this, haven't uh, read Gavin's book, I do strongly recommend they do so, as well as mine, of course. Of um, course, yeah. I was just going to say, <laughs> of course, you know, the, the, we'll, we'll still put available. The, yeah, we'll put the link in the YouTube video and and the um, obviously the, the podcast link as well for anyone's listening to it. But you said there about you have to approach it with different angles as opposed to just going to speaking to players and that sort of stuff. Can you give us a bit of insight into that? I mean, how because if I was in that position and I was looking at doing a piece on somebody like that and I spoke to players surrounding them and they said, there's not really that much to say, to be honest, I think I'd probably give up. And I mean, did you ever get to that point where you thought about that, about Harry, that you thought maybe there's not, not a book to, to really be written here? Yeah, uh, uh, you're right. It, you did think, mm, we can't just have 10 people saying that Harry wasn't on the training pitch much and he was a disciplinarian. Um, but some people gave better insights, sort of Colin Harvey, who has, has a heck of a lot of respect for Harry and, and vice versa. Harry had a lot of respect for him. He gave good insights. And then I was lucky enough to get Harry's family uh, uh, to help me and giving me access to actually stuff that Harry had written about his career. So you're getting some of his own personal insights into what, why he was what he was and what he achieved so I think that that helped bring it to life if I hadn't had the cooperation of uh, Harry Catrick's family then the book maybe the book would have never come to fruition so I'm very grateful to them uh, but it, it was a great period to write about the 60s I mean my I think my two favorite decades for Everton are the 30s and the 60s because in both of them we won the league a couple of times you know we won a cup Probably, if anything, the 30s, I think, is the most fascinating decade because we, we started off with it getting relegated, bounced straight back up, won the league, won the cup the next season, then had a bit of a wobble, almost got relegated again, and then bounced back right at the end of the 30s, won the league title with that fantastic you know, side with Tommy Lawton, Joe Mercer, yeah. Tommy Jones. And then, of course, World War II gets declared. So, you know, the 30s and the 60s are the ones that I love to keep going back to because there's just so much there to... Uh, to write about and still more stuff to learn about you know going through the going through the archives and uh can i just give a mention to a website uh that a guy called billy smith does called blue correspondent mm. blue correspondent dot, dot co dot uk and billy has spent uh probably 15 years or so just transcribing 
articles, newspaper reports about Everton all the way back to Victorian times. And I, I and others wouldn't have been able to do the research we've done without just being able to go to Billy's website and just looking up all this stuff. And I, I heartily recommend if somebody wants to lose five hours of their life this afternoon <laughs> during lockdown, go to bluecorrespondent.co.uk and just read, you know, go through and want, read these wonderful match reports and, and articles. And the way journalists wrote back then, sports journalists, it was fantastic, the use of language. So again, it, a big shout out to Billy for the work that he's done for, for me and other Everton historians. It's always worth, worth checking it out. Absolutely, it's it's great resource. And, and looking at, at the thirties there, as you mentioned, you know all the, all those ups and downs. It it just feels like the antithesis of what we've we've had in, in recent years, where we've just sort of been, you know, between seventh and, and twelfth in the table, just 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 ambling along. And I was speaking to um, Dave Prentice about this on, on Brew of Blue a couple of weeks ago, and sort of asking him about the the challenges that face the, the, the next generation of Everton writers that are going to potentially write about this period and. You sort of look at it and think, there's, there's not really, you know, you, you said there about Harry Catterick and how it was potentially a challenge to write a book about him, albeit the success, you know, and you, you, you yourself and Gallagher done fantastic research into it. It feels as though maybe now that there might, might not, not, not be anything in particular as, as an angle or things to cover for, for the next generation, really. Yeah, you're right. I mean, the boys years, you know, it was fantastic consistency, bar, you know, barring one or two seasons. And how, how do you... <laughs> yeah. as you write a book about that and yeah you could you could have a catalogue of managerial changes I suppose in the past six years and write something about that but but absolutely I don't know how you'd make that an interesting book we, we need to we need to win something we need to be challenging something for, for us to write about and celebrate and also to inspire you know the next generation of fans all go the other way and get okay, me okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not suggesting we do that for a book honestly <laughs> not, not worth it um, but I think Dave also makes the point, you know, it, it's for writing a book about this period, it's what source she goes to. Yes, she can refer to match reports and stuff, but the access yeah, to players, managers, I think that's all changed. I think I think uh, when when Dave's been on, he's alluded to that. So, you know, it's it's just a whole different ball game now in terms of the media coverage, and I, I don't really don't know how you how you'd approach it now if you were sort of writing a book about everything in the sort of 2010s or 2020s, but. Uh, that's why I keep going back to the past. Far easier. <laughs> Much more interesting anyway. I uh, just, just want to have a chat about a couple of uh, pieces that you've, you've done recently. Uh, read one uh, earlier this week that you put out on top of your web about Dennis Stevens, the, the players' mm. player. Um, do, do you want to give us a bit of an insight in, into him? Because he's got, he's got a, a pretty fascinating backstory and, and a great tale. Yeah, Dennis, uh, one of the great unsung heroes, really. Although, you know, a lot of fans did appreciate him. Um, his sort of initial claim to fame is that he's the second cousin of um, Duncan Edwards. You know, they both grew up to, together in in Dudley in the West Midlands and both moved up to Lancashire. Obviously, um, Duncan went to Manchester United in great fame. And uh, Dennis went up to Bottom Wanderers uh, and played with Nat Lofthouse, won the FA Cup there. Um, and then Harry Catterick brought him in in 62 um, uh, to replace Bobby Collins. And... Uh, if you speak to many fans probably in their 70s and over, Bobby Collins was their hero. He was my dad's hero. If My dad didn't dish out praise easily, uh, but yeah. you, you mentioned Bobby Collins and he would eulogise. So, so poor Dennis was brought into the Everton team to basically replace Collins, Bobby Collins. And you can imagine that the Everton crowd can be a tough, yeah. a tough one. Uh, so... Dennis had to come in and convince them, um, and that took a while. He, I think he got his share of stick, mainly because he wasn't Bobby, but he, he was the engine room. He was, he, it proves the point that, you know, you, you don't just want a team of 11 superstars. You want a team that's cohesive and well-balanced, and, and Dennis was the engine. He had a fantastic, physically, engine on him. He could just run and run and run, and he'd do the donkey work. He'd win the ball back. He'd, he'd burst back 50 yards to win the ball back when we'd lost it, and then give it to Alex Young. Roy Vernon and the like to to put the ball in the net and, and get the glory. So I think he was um, a great a great player. Didn't always get the credit he deserved, but without him, would we have won the league? Maybe not. So um, yeah, fascinating story. And Dennis eventually moved on. He saw out his career at Oldham and Tranmere, um, but then he didn't become a, a pub owner or, um, or or a coach. He became a gents outfitter back in Bolton. <laughs> Um, which is uh, not not your most common career, but he'd always loved fashion. You see the pictures of him, like on the website, you'll see he looks always dapper, always immaculate. 
yeah, yeah, I love them great. So yeah, uh, lovely guy, and by all accounts, a lovely, you know, great friend to people like Derek Temple, Mick Megan. They spoke so highly of him. Um, so it was, it was a pleasure and, and a, you know, privilege to work with his family to just bring his story out there and, and some of the comments they've had back are lovely. And um, so that's what it's about: it's just bringing people to uh, to uh, give, get, getting them the attention that they deserve that they don't always get. Uh, and Dennis is a, is a case in point. When, when I was reading it, and one of the things that, that you said there really struck home is that I think there's this perception of Goodison Park now from our fans that if you, if you come in and work hard, eventually you'll, you'll win. You'll win them over, yeah. regardless of what happens. And to, yeah. to a lesser extent, this this story a little bit, you know, apart from the, you know, the outside of it and, the, and you know, the, the suits and all that at the end, the, the playing side of it reminded me a little bit of what happened with, with Stephen Naismith when he came in. And everyone looked at him initially and thought, who on earth is this fella? You know, he couldn't really control the ball properly. He was struggling. But because he worked hard and because he grafted, because he felt a little bit like one of us and from that sort of similar background, that working class background, the people just gave him a chance and gave him time. And eventually, you know, he didn't go on to have the same sort of success that Dennis had in winning the league title or anything like that. But he left the football club well-revered and well-thought of. No, I think that's a really good example. Uh, you're, you're right, the stick uh, that uh, Naismith uh, had when he came. And, and I think, to be fair to, to Stephen, I think he was still recovering from a couple yeah, of the yeah. operations. And yeah. I, I, think, I think we'd sort of bought him when he was still on that road to recovery. Um, I don't think we saw that you know anything like the best from till the till the following season. But you're right; he he just applied himself, kept trying, and and won the fans over th- through his endeavour uh, and as well as his, his vital goals. And I think we missed him when we sold him. I understand why he left; he wasn't getting picked that often. It was probably the right move for him. But I think his mentality was really missed when when he went to Norwich, and uh, we we could have done with hanging on to him. A bit like we talk about Leighton Baines. You need you need the right characters in the dressing room, and I think Nay Smith on the pitch in the dressing room and the other stuff he did working with uh, like I think the Whitechapel Centre and the like. Yeah. Just just the kind of player that person that you want at your club to to lead by example. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a really great example. And I think Dennis also, uh, going back to Dennis Stevens, I think he was probably a great influence on Colin Harvey. Um, not the same player as Colin a more naturally talented player, I think it's fair to say, and obviously became a a superstar, but that that sort of application professionalism that Dennis showed, and that drive, and that that work effort, work ethic, on the pitch, it, you know, it can't help but have inspired sort of a young Colin Harvey just coming through. And Colin eventually, you know, did take uh, Dennis's place in the team. But I think Dennis was very gracious about it and helped Colin along the way. Was was that the case? And I mean, I, I genuinely don't know the answers. They're just just asking as a total question. Did, was that the case for all? That squad at that time, because obviously Everton went through a bit of a, a transition, didn't they? When the likes of Harvey, uh, Joe Royal, um, Alan Ball, uh, Howard Kendall came in, was before that team sort of became what it was and the juggernaut it was. Did all of those younger players have those sort of role models to look up to in the squad? Or was it very much like an organic thing where they came in and just and just took the team on? Because I, I imagine, like you said there, it, it would have been a, a tough club to come into at the time, given the you know Goodison Park and and what had happened beforehand. Yeah, and a, and a tough dressing room as well. I mean, you, yeah. you hear the stories of the sort of uh, sort of initiation uh, that some of the young lads had to come through, some of the local lads. Um, I, I would say Dennis is probably a great example of somebody who took people under his wing and, and was generous. I, I can't say that every player was like that. I'm sure the players, old senior players, are always very wary of you know the young lads coming through because they know that eventually that, that young lad's going to be oh, after their sure. place. So uh, I, I think Dennis was... was Probably a particular example of somebody who was helpful, inspiring, and uh, probably one of the you know the best that you could have at your club as a role model. Um, you know, you have fantastic players like you know Roy Vernon, who I wrote about. Yeah, you know, brilliant player. I don't know if Roy would have been going around showing younger lads how to sort of try and take his place in the team. Yeah. But on the other hand, his brilliance on the pitch and in training, you know, would, would have been an inspiration. So, yeah. Yeah, a uh, bit of a double-edged sword in that sense <laughs> in regards to that. Uh, but yeah, do, do, I'll put, I'll, the link, like I said again, will be in, in the uh, the bio and description on YouTube. There's so many good articles Rob's done about these these players. Tommy Ellington, Tommy Tommy e. Jones as well. Uh, Mick Eaton's on there as well. There's, there's so many fascinating reads. So do, do head over to Top Web and, and check them out. Uh, loads of other good stuff on there, of course, as well. Um, just before we wrap up, uh, anything planned coming up? Any other features for, for Top Web? Any other books you've got in the pipeline? <laughs> Well, um, my friend uh, David France, the the founder of the 
Everton FC Heritage Society. Uh, David lives over in Arizona. Uh, he's been living there since the 70s and uh, he's had uh, a sort of a brainwave, this inspiration to actually write a book called Toffee Soccer. Uh, and that's going to celebrate Everton's links to North America, USA wow. and Canada. Over the years, going all the way back to when we first, you know, we, we had sort of players with links to there all the way back to the uh, early 20th century. And Sam, Sam Chedzoy, the famous Everton right winger who led to the corner kick rule being changed in the 20s. He, he played in Canada and, um, and in the USA. He led to and the corner kick rule being changed. What was that all? Yeah. <laughs> um, there was a, a journalist at the Echo um, um, who, who used the name B. That was his pen name. And uh, he, he'd gone through the rule book and noticed that there was no rule in, in the, nothing in the rule book to say that you couldn't take a corner kick, kick it, and then kick it again and again, and actually basically dribble the ball from the, the corner kick mm. um, and, and basically boot it into the goal. Um, so he um, wanted to approach a player with a, with a bit of a wager to say, you know, about you, you know, I'll give you a, whatever, a fiver if you try doing this in a match and see what happens. And apparently he, uh, this journalist approached the Liverpool player who wasn't up for it, and then he approached Sam and said, yeah, I'll do that. So uh, Everton got a corner, Sam went to take it, put it on the, uh, on the corner kick spot, and then just dribbled the ball and had a shot at goal. Um, legend says that he scored, he didn't actually, he missed. But then the referee blew the whistle and said, no, that's not allowed. And Sam said, well, where is it in the rule book? And of course, as a result of that, um, one, Sam won his bet and got his money. Uh, but two, the FA had to go away and look at the rule book and realise that there was nothing to stop players doing that, so they had to change the <laughs> so they had to change the rules to, wow. to mean that you could only touch the ball once if you were the taker of a corner kick. So yeah, so Sam and Everton changed the rules of football. Uh, so Sam, though, he was one of the first sort of Everton players to go over to the states, but lots lots have done so since. I think we reckon about eighty odd have um, represented clubs in North America, um, and one or two have come from North America, obviously over to uh, to play for Everton. People like Bram McBride, Joe Max Moore. Tim Howard and, and others. So this book is really to celebrate those links and uh, hopefully further them. Um, as we say, it's going to be called Toffee Soccer. David's been uh, hunkered down in Arizona during the lockdown, uh, doing lots of work, and I've just been helping him with uh, bits and bobs uh, at this point. So hopefully that will come out in the next year or so. Um, and it, it should be a great, uh, a great project. I'm sure David will come on mm. uh, and talk to you about it in greater depth at some point. Uh, the other thing I've been doing for years and just haven't really got very far with is a project about the Everton team that won the league just before the war in 1939 and like profile all the players so your Joe Mercers and your Ted Sagar so yeah. I've been trying to catch up on getting that book about the the team with 39 out uh, done as well so yeah keeping busy um, but uh, hopefully you'll hear more about the, uh, the Toffee Soccer in the, in the weeks and months ahead. Absolutely, it sounds really exciting. Uh, Rob, thanks very much for, for coming on. Really appreciate you taking the time out to chat with us. Always, always learn something new. Corner, corner kick, routine, all that sort of thing. Unbelievable, unbelievable yeah. football knowledge. But uh, like I said, uh, do check out all of Rob's pieces on Toffee Web. All the links to all the relevant things, the books, the articles, all that sort of stuff will be in the description below or on your podcast. Uh, and we will speak to you again here very soon here on the Blue Room YouTube channel with another Brew of a Bloom. <laughs>